here we're gonna get started now. So lecture number 11. Uh, lecture number 11, we'll consider a pump model and uh, flexible bodies. And of course, the, the main body of the, today's explanation is devoted to flexible bodies. And uh, <clears throat> I'm kind of hoping that if everything goes as planned, I could get started with the real-time simulation today already. And that would be outstanding because, you know, this lecture that is a lecture ID 12 is devoted to practical applications. Because every now and then I got the criticism about this course, which says that, yeah, nice uh, theoretical thing about parcel this, parcel that, but what is the practical role of all that? Uh, the practical role all become clear to you when I'm explaining this real-time simulation and games related to uh, explanations. And even though that this says real-time simulation, it covers pretty much, you know, multi-body simulation and simulation of dynamic systems in general, computational dynamics, if you may. And how is the role of the computational dynamics in different product processes? Uh, that's where I would like to explain how is it you can use it in a marketing, in um, service business and so on and so forth, and not just to limit ourselves to product development. Now, uh, so that's what's gonna follow. So, and one more thing about that, the hydraulics. So as the pump is the last component considering the hydraulics, once I'm done with the pump modeling, or explain the how you can model the pump, then I will have a simple example that kind of summarize how is it you can do the algebraic equation and differential equations needed to estimate the forces produced by hydraulic circuit. So with that, yeah, and again, sorry about the technical difficulties, that definitely was the worst start ever. And I see that uh, number of views today is uh, exceptionally low. So I only have 26 views. And of course, maybe this is uh, simply because of the timing is not the usual one. But anyways, so uh, now we're gonna get started. And once I'm done with the, today's lecture, then the final like climax of the course is the only way to dance the real-time simulation. Okay. All right, but uh, prior to jumping on to uh, the new material, let's summarize what we discussed last week. So last week, again, why is that the slide is jumping a bit? Okay, I see that I can. I need to do the minor adjustment here, just a second. Okay, I need to make it a bit bigger. Like this. Okay, so last week we discussed about um, how is that we can model a direction valve. And direction valve is a typical model you need to use when, we mod when you're modeling the hydraulic components. A typical model in the perspective that it requires two steps. First step is something that you are estimating one way or another a spool position. And uh, when uh, you have an estimation about the spool position, then you can estimate the flow rate through your component. And uh, okay, so there was a comment about uh, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I think that I accidentally said something incorrect because I, I, somebody said that I said that the next week lecture will be on Thursday. And uh, that was of course incorrect information. So it will be on Tuesday. So it, Tuesday, which is a, a last day of this month, 30th of, of November, and it's gonna be at uh, 4.15. And that will be, face-to-face -face lecture and the face-to-face -face lecture will take a place in that uh, largest lecture room that is available in LUT University and that's the one that is called the Skin Narilla lecture room or something like that. So uh, so on Tuesday at four o'clock so let me put it in a writing here so it's a uh, last day of November at 4.15, 4.15. Okay, and then uh, the lecture will take um, hour and a half, roughly hour and a half, hopefully not more than that, because right after the lecture, we have this chin-up challenge. 
And in the chin-up challenge, it's simple game. So if you can make more chin-ups that I'm able to do, you can get extra points. And um, uh, maybe I'm going to make some twists to that rules as well. But uh, that I will explain to you next week. Okay, back to the uh, direction valve modeling. So like I explained, the direction valve modeling consists of two parts. First, you estimate the position of the spool. Once you have that estimate, then you estimate how much is a flow rate through your component. And flow rate depends on the pressure difference. Now the pressure difference, typical, typical pressure difference uh, or the typical flow rate, yeah, better to say typical flow rate is the one that we are assuming flow to have turbulent form. This is very, very typical case. Uh, okay, so there was a more explanation about um, about the lecture. Okay, so lecture uh, Thursday. So I think that I have made a, made a little bit of mis mistakes about my explanations. Anyways, I'm still going to deliver this lecture like uh, no problem. And those of you that are unable to see the streaming will simply take a look at the, uh, the recording. Okay, guys, so you're saying that the, I thought that, that it would be on Thursday. Seems that I have made a mistake. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Anyways, so it's today. And again, those of you that are not able to follow this one, you can see... You can take a look at the recordings. Okay, back to the hydraulics. We also look at shortly about something that is seems to have a lot, a lot of future potential in a hydraulic, and that's uh, digital hydraulics. And the idea of the digital hydraulics is to replace the motion of the spool by a number of on-off valves, on-off solenoid or puppet valves. And uh, these solid valves could have a different sizes. You know, one can have, you know, capacity of uh, one liter per minute, second can have a f two liters per minute, and then the third can have a four meters per minute, and then the final one can have an eight, eight liters per minute. And now you opening and closing those uh, on-off valves in uh, using a different kind of um, algorithms, um, open and closing those valves make it possible to replicate the motion of the the spool. That's an idea of the digital hydraulics or digital flow and pressure valves based on the digital hydraulics. And you can learn more about digital hydraulics by looking at this YouTube video here. And uh, okay, so I can see that there are more communication about when the lecture is supposed to take a place. So it seems that the case was such that I said last week that the lecture will be on Thursday. But I emailed to you and said that it's on Tuesday. That I believe that is a case because I too thought initially that the lecture will be on Thursday. But then I was checking my, my weekly schedule and I realized that even the Thursday is a little bit a busy day to me. So that's why it is on Tuesday. My apologies. My apologies. Okay, now, now again, back to the hydraulics. So you see, we are going on and off with the hydraulics, and I see that I need to make a final tuning about my my slide. So just a second. This one, and now it should be okay for rest of the lecture. Okay. Hydraulic cylinder is the one that is converting hydraulic pressure to be a mechanical force. Uh, this is a typical actuator, typically used in, well, mobile machinery, industrial application, and uh, many others. So this is how it typically works. So we have a motor that is then operating a pump. Pump is producing the flow rate to the system, and the flow rate is controlled via valves to actuators, which are you know, cylinder or a motor. Cylinder or cylinder is capable to produce a linear force, linear motion, whereas the pump is capable to produce torque and rotational motion. So this is how it goes in a nutshell. Now what happens inside of the hydraulic cylinder is that the pressure 
zone in this equation are converted to be a force. So we have a pressure that is applying in a piston side, which is this one here, and the pressure that is applying in a piston rod side, which is the one that is shown here. Now these two forces are, are subtracted from each other, and that's your hydraulic force, in theory. But the component that you also need to be often taken into account is a friction force due to the ceiling. And the ceiling is the ones that are located here and here. And uh, usually the friction can be accounted by using um, kind of like a curve fitting technique in which we have a curve that is having a roughly a shape like this one here. Uh, like this. And then the how how high is this this peaks of this curve? It depends on the, the force produced by hydraulic cylinder. So this one here is actually defined by this part of the equation. And in this part of the equation, we have a net force uh, that is then uh, multiplied by um, roughly our efficiency of the hydraulic cylinder, or min one minus efficiency of the hydraulic cylinder. And that's uh, a force that is representing the friction. Roughly, the efficiency, you can estimate this to be, um, well, say, 95%. Um, so that's a, that's a friction force is roughly 5% of the, the forces. It could be even a little less than that. So it's not playing significant role, but it's playing a role in terms of the dynamic behavior. And uh, the reason being that it is damping the vibration. So that's, of course, is something that is, that is significant and important taken into account. Okay, so, now, one more component which is left to discuss is the pump model. And the pump model is kind of simple, but the pump model really depends on what kind of pump we are discussing about. There are a number of different kind of pumps, and now we need to familiarize ourselves a little bit about the pump technology. Not in, uh, you know, all the necessary detail, but in a modeling perspective, you know, what are the different scenarios how the pump can be used. And now this is important because, you know, the pump or the, how the pump is operating makes a great deal of difference in terms of how efficient or how is energy consumption of your hydraulic circuit. But, you know, let's take a look. Idea of the pump is the plug to produce flow rate. So it is producing the flow rate, at least in a modeling perspective. So it's like a continuous, or it's a kind of like a source of the flow. And when you're restricting or when you're limiting the flow, this is when you're going to get the pressure. Well, this is a little bit of like a question of chicken and egg. But in a modeling perspective, we need to get started from something. And where we're going to get started is a flow rate. And we're going to simply make a model of the flow produced by a pump. And it means that we are estimating this particular component. And then you know that if you can uh, restrict the flow rate, you can get the pressure. And how much pressure you can get? Well, that's, you can estimate that using that force order differential equation as we're going to practice after a little while. But now the pumps, you know, they can have a fixed volume operation principle, which means that the pump is always producing the flow rate roughly the same amount regardless of its needs. Or maybe the better way to say that energy produced to the system will be always to be constant. And that will be always constant because these uh, fixed volume pumps are operated by motor. And the motor have a constant uh, uh, angular velocity and it is um, operating the mechanical system that is unable to make any kind of adjustment. So the energy production or energy input, energy feedback, energy input, that's the better way to say, for the system is con con all the time constant. And that, of course, you know, that uh, there are cases that you really don't need um, hydraulic forces. You still keep on introducing the energy to the system. Uh, this energy needs to be released one way or another. A typical way that it is released is that there is a pressure relief valve where this uh, pump is connected. The pre pressure relief valve could have a like drawing symbol roughly like this. 
there shouldn't be this line here like this and you know when the pressure is high enough then the the, the flow travels back to the tank and here's a tank and then the pump will take a flow from the tank and pumping is like this and of course this kind of circulation makes no sense because even in the worst scenario when you do that you have to have a radiator of some kind to make sure that the fluid is um, not overheating so but that could be the one scenario you can use it and it's still used in certain uh, industrial applications so how do you, how are the pumps in when you take a close detailed look about the pumps well they could be gear pumps which is mostly at least a uh, when I was active in uh, in hydraulics, this was mainly a um, kind of the technique that was using uh, sensors, flow sensors, and other sensors used in uh, hydraulics. These wing pumps, uh, not so often, but the piston pump is very heavily used. This is like a conventional, or most often used construction of the pump. So piston pump, simple scenario, you make this piston to move back and forth. So when the piston is moving this right hand side of the direction, the flow rate is getting into this chamber and then the, when the piston is moving back it, it is producing the flow rate to hydraulic system so that's its operation principle in short now modeling perspective if you are dealing with the constant volume pumps of excuse me, fixed volume pump well then the model is very simple then we're gonna use this uh, power equation, which is a power equal the flow rate multiplied by pressure as a foundation of the pump model. And you can imagine that this is going to be very straightforward. We simply are estimating the flow rate from this equation. So it's going to be, you know, solving the Q from this equation. So it's, well, this is its already shown, so no need to put it in the writing. So this, this where it is shown. So, uh, let me explain in a, in a second where are these components in this equation. But anyways, so we're using this most simplest equation used in the hydraulics, which is a definition of power. Now, in this definition of power, we have the maximum power of the motor. So this is the one that is an external system that is operating the pump how much power it is capable to produce that's going to be a one factor of this equation and then the one that is uh, down here is the set pressure of the hydraulic uh, pump and this is a mechanical efficiency which by the way is something that is a little bit complicated to define in a real life because the efficiency depends on many different factors but again because we're cutting corners in the hydraulic modeling we are assuming that the, this mechanical efficiency is just the scalar value, which is typically not the function of any other parameters. So it's just a scalar component. How much that's supposed to be? Well, you know, the good estimate could be something like 0 0.9. There is a limit, however. Uh, the limit is the fact that, you know, the, due to the um, mechanical dimensions and geometry pump, there is a maximum flow rate that it can produce. And what we need to do in the modeling is that we are comparing the kind of like theoretical flow production using this power equation. And we also comparing the what's the ultimate maximum flow rate that it is uh, coming from the dimension of the pump. So we're comparing those two factors and then we're selecting the one that is giving us the lower value, lower value is the one we used. So that's the fixed volume pump. Not complicated at all, at all. So it's very straightforward. But things becomes to be more complicated when we're using more sophisticated pumps. And more sophisticated pumps are the ones where there is a possibility to control the flow rate. And those are called variable volume pumps. In a variable volume pumps, flow rate is not a constant or the, um, again, that's not the good statement, so let me rephrase that. So the energy consumption or energy production for the system can vary, and it can vary based on the need of the pressure. How it is then operated? Well, in a simplest possible system, we can use a constant pressure control, 
And the constant pressure control is something that is good to get started because it's a big brother or a bit more advanced development is something that is called load sensing control. A load sensing control is kind of the same idea, but it's more advanced in a way that uh, you're not just monitoring the one location of the hydraulic circuit, but many locations. And is typically used in a mobile application where the energy consumption is critical. And it is, of course, it could be used in industrial applications too, but sometimes, okay, this statement is something that I'm not 100% sure, but it used to be the case that in, in as a rule of thumb, uh, in industrial applications, that reliability was such a big issue that in certain applications, they prefer to use fixed volume pumps because these have they have this tendency to be more reliable than variable volume pumps. And uh, of course, then the energy consumption was um, not so optimal. Whereas in um, mobile applications, the energy consumption is a critical issue and you need to make sure that you're not losing the energy. And in those applications, there were first this uh, constant pressure control and then more often load sensing control. Now back to these controlling schemes. What are these controlling schemes? Well, in these variable volume pumps, you're def deriving or you're using first order differential equation to estimate the flow rate. So look at this. So this is a very important to understand that, you know, in this equation, we don't compute directly the flow rate. No, we don't do that, but we're computing instead the, the flow rate with respect to time. So that's a Q dot, Q dot. So it's telling us, are we increasing or decreasing the flow rate? Like the pressure equation, the P dot. So it's not a pressure, but it's telling you, are you increasing or decreasing the pressure? And by solving that equation, you can figure out what is a pressure at any given time. Okay? Here too, so we have this differential equation that is telling us increasing, decreasing. Now that I already is telling you that, okay, here's a control scheme. So this is not just a dumb system that is keep on producing the flow rate, but there's a little bit of um, thinking behind. What kind of thinking? Well, constant pressure control. That's uh, something that is easy to get started. So, so constant pressure control is something that we have like checkpoint. Measurement point, checkpoint is a good word too, right off the pump, where we're measuring, okay, how is a pressure in this particular location? And this pressure here is the one that is this PP zone in the equation. Okay? Then you're comparing this pressure that is measured right off the pump to set pressure, which is the one that you're hoping this pump is producing to you. Okay? Let's say that the you know, here, let's say hypothetically, the set pressure is 240 bars, all right? Then you're measuring here that the pressure is not 240 bars, but it's, a, let's say, 180 bars. It's okay, so that means that, you know, there is a positive value, which is then multiplied by something which is, of course, semi-empirical parameter, and then you're measuring that how is the current flow production at the time constant. And based on the time constant, you're adjusting the flow production. So that's just simply how it is operating. And now let's say in another scenario, set pressure is all the time same, so it's 240 parts, but the pressure here that is measured is for some reason, uh, let's say 250 bars. Okay, 250 bars, like this. And in that case, you know, then uh, you look at this, so it's going to be uh, 450 minus uh, 250, so it's going to be negative value. So then the flow rate is going to be decreasing. So that's how it's going to go in uh, that particular scenario. Okay. Now, what about this load sensing control? What is the concept of this load sensing control? Well, it's a bit more advanced in the sense that you are making sure that each of the actuators has a certain pressure reserve in the use, pressure reserve in the use. Let me try to explain it that in, by cleaning a little bit this uh, 
Oh, hold on, hold on. This one. Hmm. Ah, not that. No, no, that that too, that too. Mm. Okay. Hopefully, I'm not destroying too much stuff. Oh, okay, so the, I, I took one more line accidentally off. Okay, so it's almost there. Okay, now load sensing. Let me try to explain it here. So I have here several hydraulic cylinders. Let's just put the two hydraulic, hydraulic cylinders to make this simple. And then we have, sorry that the drawing is somehow difficult today. So there's going to be direction valve here. This one, oh God, it is this difficult. There's another direction valve here. And the direction valves are then connected to pump. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm plugging the views. The pump have to be here. So not this one, but the pump is going to be here. And what we're going to do here is that we have like a pilot drives here, or pilot lines, maybe the better way to say it. Pilot lines, which goes in this, uh, this kind of valves, which are selecting the, the highest pressure from this particular location. Then I have, I have here another kind of uh, pilot um, lines like this, which is also selling the, the highest pressure. And then there's a one more component. Again, now I'm selecting the highest. And now this maximum pressure, this highest pressure, is then computed or, or is evaluated about the pressure that is you know, somewhere here. And now we want to make sure that there's a, this pressure is always with a certain difference with the one of the pressure that is applying with the hydraulic actuators. So it's meaning that we always make sure, you know, if the, let's, let's say hypothetically there is a pressure here, which is a 200 bars. And we set setting this uh, delta P to be, uh, let's say 50 bars. So it makes sure that if this is the highest pressure, the pressure right off the pump will be 250 bar. That's always a 50 bar reserve that is available there. So if this is gonna be, uh, let's say 150 bar, uh, the other pressures are lower than that. You know, then the, the pump, or the pressure right off the pump will be 200 bars. So it's always adjusting the situation based on how is a current need of the forces of the system. Now, really don't know if you're unable to, to or if you were able to follow my explanations here. I don't know about that, but Take a look at this awesome video, which is, uh, you know, the one that is shown here. And um, once we're in a team session, I'm going to place this to you. So you can, you can simply copy paste that from the chat window of the team session and take a look at it by yourself. It's a great video because it simply tells you with the simple words and simple animation, what is the deal with this bloat sensing pump? Highly recommended to take a look at that. And here's a better description about the load sensing pump. You know, I tried to explain that, you know, we are measuring, or we are monitoring the highest pressure of the system. And that's made by using these subtle valves. The, but these are the ones that are having this drawing symbol or having the, the figure like this, this. This is how it goes inside. And this is how it is leaving. And now you're selecting, again, you're selecting here the highest pressure. And then that's the one that is then compared against the pressure right after here in a pump. And you then make sure that these two pressures are with a certain difference all the time. That's the concept of the load sensing. Hopefully you got my idea. Now there's one mysterious component, this K parameter here that is needed in a... Uh, pump modeling, the semi-empirical pump modeling. That again is something that you can get from characteristic curve of the manufacturers. So you're simply taking a look at about the, the curve, which is a, made such the way that the y-axis is a flow rate and the x-axis is a pressure, pressure. And it's typically having this kind of form. And this is where you can estimate the K. So with that, now 
let me ask you something. Oh my God, I, I realize that I haven't locked myself to circuit. So just a second, I have I? Yes, I have. So here it is. Um, but I haven't launched the, the sync, uh, squeeze yet. But it's launched now. Okay, so uh, first thing class squeeze of the day is this one. In hydraulic model, a pump is assumed to produce what? Pressure for hydraulic circuit, a oil flow, flow for hydraulic circuit, a temperature for hydraulic circuit, voltage to electric circuit. So one is on one only is correct. Which one is correct? Let me know. Okay, and uh, Oh, hold on, hold on. I need to, I need to send a message. Oh, okay. You guys put the case, get the competition on. <clears throat> mm. Okay, so back to you then. So, um, game is on, and as we have a little less uh, participants today than usually. Uh, I think we pretty much all done. So because I got 38 uh, um, answers. Yep, here it is. Uh, some of you already put the came on. So you you make your guesses. And it looks that it's, uh, you know, some of you are thinking that uh, today we're going to score high, very high. And hydraulic is there. Prayer. Okay, so it's uh, yeah, there is a typing mistake. There is a you're right about that, so let me correct that immediately. Uh, here, okay, so let me. Oh, not this one. Uh, uh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I need to put it back. Okay. So, uh, success rate today is uh, 72. 72, which is okay. And, you know, good news is this. You know, others are guessing the pressure for the hydraulic circuit, which is okay too. So, that kind of makes sense. But we agreed earlier that in a hydraulic modeling procedure, we're always looking at the flow, oil flow, the flow rate. That's the one we're modeling there. All right. Now with that, let me take this off. Ah, oh, not this one, but this one. And let me move with you. So let me walk with you to another aspect of the hydraulic uh, 
uh, modeling. So here's an example that I wanted to show to you. Okay, so I have here a simple hydraulic circuit where I'm assumed that there is a constant pressure source. So there's a pressure source, which is a, you know, let's call the pressure P, pressure P. And then I have here direction valve, which is solenoid operated pressure, direction valve, solenoid, op solenoid operated uh, direction valve. And then uh, the direction valve is connected via hose line to throttle, like so on here. And this, uh, this hose is then connected to cylinder. And then there is a cylinder which has a piston and piston rod side. Piston rod side is then connected to direction valve and direction valve is then connected to tank. Now, I want to spend a couple of minutes with you to show how is that you can model the hydraulic circuit like shown in this figure here. Okay, so the procedure is fairly simple. So first thing is discretization. You're making an assumption about the volumes where you're assuming the pressure to be equally distributed. Equally distributed. So, uh, so obviously, we can say that the pressure along this hose line or pipeline here can be assumed to be equally distributed. So the pressure here have to be constant all the time. Now the pressure that is in this line here and in the hydraulic chamber that is shown here, then uh, that pressure too can be assumed to be constant. You can assume that the pressure here is same that the pressure in that corner, assuming that there is no throttle in a hose connection to cylinder, which there is usually no throttles. And again, here, you know, pressure in a cylinder rod side can be assumed to be the same that the pressure here. So that's how it is working. So, um, and uh, yeah, that's how we're going to go. And uh, the next thing, like I said, is this discretization. So we're discretizing this hydraulic circuit, such the way that we are modeling uh, <clears throat> this uh, circuit by using three volumes. And we're comparing the pressure in each of these three volumes. Now, the first volume is something that we are assuming that the, the flow that is coming from the direction valve is having the positive flow direction as it is shown in this figure here. And then uh, we have a throttle here. And again, I'm just uh, making a decision about what is a positive flow direction. And you can make this signs so however you want. But once you have made your decision, then you need to be consistent with your decision, okay? Then I have here the pressure two, and then in a piston rod side, I have pressure T, two, excuse me, T, and again, then the flow that is leaving from there is having this positive direction. Now, again, you can make a decision as you want, but this decision has a significant effect when you're comparing your pressure differential equations. And now, what we're gonna do is that we're gonna practice a little bit about how to compute this, uh, different aspects. And now, let me see. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm a little bit distracted here because I keep on uh, receiving WhatsApp messages about something that is like my private hobby, but there's a little bit of situation in my private hobby and uh, that's uh, what makes me confused. Sorry about that. So let me let me just simply collect my thoughts and let me finalize this this story here all right so this um the steps we're going to do to, to, to model this hydraulic circuit are the ones that i'm going to walk with you i'm going to walk through these steps so the first step was this discretization now it's called idealization discretization will work as well all right so that's step number one now the step number two Forming the equation that describes the volumes. Forming the equation that describes the volumes. Simple, but still needs some, a little bit of thinking. First volume is, that's very simple. That's simply the volume of the hose line or pipeline that connects the direction valve to this throttle valve. This volume is not changing its size. So it's all the time constant size symbol in that perspective. Second one is not constant anymore and it's not constant because the piston can move up and down here and the piston motion is measured by using coordinate x here coordinate x now how is that i can measure the volume or how is that i can compute the volume of this second uh 
chamber here. So that's going to be the volume of the hose line or pipeline that is connected from the throttle, the cylinder, and then the one volume that is associated to this size of, side of the cylinder. That is obviously a cross section multiplied by displacement of the cylinder. Displacement of the cylinder. All right. Then uh, volume number three. So it's going to be hose line three, which is this hose here, plus this area here, which is, of course, cross section two, which is a, you know, piston uh, cross section minus the piston rod cross section. And then that is then multiplied by X2. And X2 is the one that you can measure by using H and X1. Not complicated at all. Very straightforward. And then comes the only difficult thing. Oh, excuse me, not yet. Next one is a difficult. Now we're going to calculate next uh, the effective bulk models. You know, this is business as usual. The first one is something that we compare the effective bulk models by accounting the, the uh, bulk models of the oil and the flexibility of the hose. So this is the first one, this one here. Second one, we, we are accounting the flexibility of oil, flexibility of the hydraulic chamber, which is most of the cases insignificant, and the flexibility of the hose line too. This one here. Third one, flexibility of oil, flexibility of the hydraulic chamber, and the flexibility of the hose line tree. This one here. Okay, and then uh, pressures. This is the difficult one. This was that I was referring as a difficult one. This is step number four. Step number four. Okay, pressure associated to this volume here is something that we need to take a look whether or not this flow rate is coming in or leaving out from this volume. Obviously, it's coming in. And because it's coming in, it has to be positive in the sign because it's producing more flow to the system. Now, when piston is moving this direction, which is positive direction here, piston is going the upwards, that is actually losing the flow rate. So that's why the second component has to be minus in a sign. Minus in a sign. All right. Okay, so then it, if it is moving this direction, what's going to happen to this piston rod side? It is producing the flow rate to this second volume. It's going to be third volume here. And this flow rate here, which is going to direction valve, is leaving. That's why minus sign here. And now comes my question to you. What about this first one? How you should form the first differential equation? Obviously, let me explain this first before I show you the in-class quiz. Obviously, it's going to be P1 dot effective bulk, excuse me, the bulk models, effective bulk models, volume, and then flow rate in, flow rate out. And the flow rates are this one and this one. But are they coming in or are they leaving? That's my question. And here's my in-class quiz. And let me put it on. Uh, here. So which one is correct? Okay. Now, all of them are comparing the pressure one. So that's a good sign. So you cannot make a call based on that. They all have the same components, which is effective bulk modulus volume. Effective bulk modulus volume. So they're all correct in that sign. But they have a different expression about the incoming and leaving flow rate. That's a difference. That's a clear difference. But which one is correct? A, B, C, or D? Tell me. And uh, you can tell me that by, um, you know, looking at this, this volume here. Think about what is coming, what is leaving. And once you make your call about leaving and coming, flow rates, then selecting the proper equation and make your vote. You, I was, sorry, I was blocking the view for C. And now I can't really proceed before that be, be any further because I really need to see your answer. And once I see your answer, then I can uh, proceed in my slides because the next slide will tell you the correct answer. Okay, and I can see that you, you have a self, very high self-confidence today because um, first two are saying 100%. 
oh my god this fit, if this would be 100 percent, that would be a big pressure to me because remember all these stories about my dancing and this kind of stuff so uh but we'll see we'll see let's first take a look at that how is the final final solution and then we can see whether or not there's going to be dancing next week tuesday at 4 15 in skinnerilla lecture okay all right so now comes uh, the numbers that are not so high anymore so these are these are significantly lower numbers <clears throat> Okay, uh, we got uh, t uh, 33 answers. Last time it was uh, 38, so we are missing five students, I guess. Well, if you know, how, let me take a look. How is that? Uh, now it looked at that we got more views. So it used to be 30 something, and now 31 or something like that. Now we have 35 views in my YouTube uh, studio. So looks good <laughs> okay so dancing a less mathematical effort yeah okay we'll see that but remember you know i highly recommend you to follow and come to see me face to face not because you want to see my face i don't think you want to really do that but the next lecture is going to be outstanding that's going to be great lecture because you know we we really kind of have a close connection to reality and i'm going to explain how is that the industrial companies at the moment are using this advanced simulation technology and what are the future perspectives and those future perspectives are awesome they are really really awesome okay and now i got the 38 answers so i'm uh, ready to close this one so here it is and the success rate is okay first of all which is the correct one Okay, which is coming and which is leaving. So that's kind of simple, kind of simple, but uh, of course, because there are so many choices, you can get easily confused. Correct one is, of course, A. Oh, 71. Okay, let me take this off and explain this to you. Oh, I'm sorry, not this, but this one again. Okay, like I said, the one that is coming in have to have a positive sign. What is coming in is this guy here. This have to be positive. Okay, so which one of out of these is positive? Uh, Q, A1. So this one and this one. This is out of the question. This is out of the question because, you know, it's a flow rate coming in. Okay. Now, then come minus in a sign. This is plus in a sign. So that's out of the question. So it's left this one only. That's the correct answer. Okay. So five, one couple more steps and then we're done with the hydraulics. Not much. Uh, here it is. So these are the pressure equations. You know, then uh, step number five, we modeling the valves and flow rates. And uh, that's going to be fairly straightforward. We're going to use the equation we learned um, last week about the throttle valve, which is this one here. This is a description of throttle valve. Uh, this is a description of uh, direction valve. And now one thing that is missing here is still this first order differential equation that solves the valve position. So this was this uh, uh, ref. Uh, excuse me, though, the, this screen is moving all the time, time constant. It was this differential equation, which you can use to compute the, the valve position. Once you know the valve position, then you can compute the, the flow rates in different scenarios. Finally, when you have made that, then you can compute the force produced by a cylinder. Simple like that. And with that, we're going to move on to completely new subject matter, which is this 
flexible bodies, flexible bodies. And, you know, kind of something funny, I, I feel like something funny was happening where I was preparing today's lecture because I was looking at the different videos about, um, you know, how is that I can illustrate you to description of deformable bodies and flexible bodies. And I was browsing over my folders and then I found out something very surprising and, and, and funny. I found out the movie that was made, oh, this was actually TV progressed that was made, if I remember correctly, I might be wrong about this year, but I think that this was made 94, 1994, those ones that I want to be funny, 1994. And uh, I want to play that to you because I think that this is great stuff. Let me just see, um, well, let me hear, let me know if you can hear this audio. Oh, hold on, I think it is a little too, can, can you hear it by the way? Uh, yeah, because the delay, or you're able to hear the, the music that was playing in the beginning here. Okay, let me play the whole story. This is great. Okay, great. So you hear it. So you ready. Tervetuloa nyt simuloinnin maailmaan. Simuloinnilla me ymmärrämme todellisuuden jäljittämistä tietokonelaskennan avulla. Simuloinnilla voimme siis esimerkiksi tarkastella jonkun koneen tai laitteen toimintaa ilman, että meidän tarvii varsinaisesti rakentaa sitä laitetta. Jo ensimmäisenä esimerkkinä tässä on aikaisemminkin esinä ollut tämä puutavarakuormain. <laughs> okay, yeah, do you recognize who was the guy in that uh, video? Not this is not in class quiz, but uh, as a curiosity, can you recognize that guy? Okay, now I guess that there is a little bit of delay. Yeah, it is me. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know if I should be happy or sad about that uh, story, but, you know, it tells me that I've been in a business uh, is that I like too long time. Anyways, so. I'm going to, um, but I was so happy to see this video. I'm going to put that in a, in a Moodle database. So, and I'm sorry that it's in Finnish. But anyways, I'm going to make it in your use. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. I like your comments. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. I were handsome. <laughs> so, <clears throat> okay. Now, now real deals. Flexible bodies. Now, what is this flexible body? So I have a little bit of explanation about how is it we can model deformable bodies. And uh, I'm going to introduce you three different ways. You know, there are actually way more than uh, uh, three different ways, but I'm going to introduce you to three ways that are fairly often used. I cannot really say that if they are most popular. Maybe, maybe what I can say that is uh, the one that is here in the middle is definitely the most often used in industrial applications. Others are used every now and then, depending on the way you really need it. And I'm going to shortly show the highlights of these different approaches. And uh, I'm going to spend the max half an hour for that. I, I think that I'm going to be prefer, I mean, not going to be spending half an hour for that because really would like to open this story about real-time simulation and practical application of simulation. All right. Flexible bodies, few observations about flexible bodies. Well, every single body is a flexible body. And this may be a little bit of surprising news to you because remember what we discussed in a period number one was about rigid bodies and assumption of rigid bodies. And I was keep on telling you that everybody needs three, everybody needs three generalized coordinates. And then uh, these Three generalized coordinates are the one that are describing the, the translation and orientation of rigid bodies. In real life, there is no such thing like rigid bodies. Every single body is a deformable body, but date deformation often can be ignored. But then there are cases that the, def that the deformation flexibility is so significant 
that your model is is not accurate. It's not representing well the reality if you are assuming it to be rigid. And then there's no other choices than taking the flexibility into account. And the flexibility can be accounted by using these techniques that I mentioned in my first slide. This land fluid theory, floating frame reference formulation, and the absolute not corner formulation. Now, this flexible multi-body dynamics or flexible description of deformable bodies is like own discipline within the computational dynamics. And it is our own discipline that is particularly tailored for description of deformable bodies that are undergoing the large translation and large rotations. And that's, of course, multi-body system. And this own discipline can be categorized to two different subcategories. And these two different subcategories are, you know, are we dealing with the small deformation or large deformation? And they are having conceptually different approaches. So if we deal with the small deformation, then the computational is, they can make it be, you can make it very efficient. You can even use them in a real-time simulation. Whereas when you wanted to describe the large deformation, it's almost impossible to describe, uh, you know, them in a real-time application. Okay, how you can know what is a small deformation and what is a large deformation? Well, mathematically is something that you can define when you are accounting the relation between the displacement. Let's say that the displacement here in the end is called as a U. U actually is a continuous function here. So the displacement that is amount of deformation. And now how you define your relation of displacement and strain. This is the one that defines whether or not you can deal with the small deformation or large deformations. In the small deformation, this relation displacement and strain is assumed to be linear, which is okay, but it has a certain consequences. And the consequence is such that if you have a cantilever beam like so on here, and you're loading the free end of the cantilever beam, and you look what's going to happen if you have this assumption of linear strain displacement relationship. It means that the free end of the cantilever beam will remain in the loading line, which is okay. I mean, this looks pretty natural. So if you have a cantilever beam like this, you're loading it here in the free end. And if the deformation looks like this, it looks kind of realistic. But the problem is that if you're increasing the force, this one here, and the finally the deformation started to look like this. You don't see this in the reality. Because in reality, it's not possible that the free end of the cantilever beam remains in a loading line. In reality, you see something like this, where there is a certain displacement in axial direction. This is something that you can take into account by introducing nonlinear strain displacement relationship. Now, which one you're using? You know, that makes a huge difference. And only in a special occasions, you should use this linear, I mean, nonlinear strain displacement relationship because it makes your computation to be very, very complicated. I'm explaining this to you because a couple of years back, student union was approaching the professors and asking like, you know, all the students would like to hear more stories about research. What research we doing at LUT University? And Good body of uh, good body of the papers and a lot of research is done here in LUT University concerning the case where there's a large deformation. There was a a recent doctoral dissertation made by uh, Papak Pohakmeri about these uh, large deformation cases. And this is just one example. There are, I think there's maybe 10 doctoral dissertations about large deformation cases in multi-body applications. So that's something that is very, very often used uh, subject matter in LUT University. Okay, so here is a cantilever beam. One model by using linear strain displacement relationship, another one with the nonlinear. You see the difference. You know, the one the closer to you is uh, moving with the roughly with the circular shape. I mean, the end of the cantilever beam goes with the circular shape or circular path. And because of this circular path, this pendulum that is in the free end of the cantilever beam 
started to vibrate like shown here. This one here is a linear and there is no motion, axial motion. Can the liver beam is, I mean the vibe, give me the pendulum is not making any motion whatsoever. Now this is a little bit of development of multibody system dynamics. So it started here in the rigid multibody system and then uh, it was extended to linear small deformation cases where this strain displacement relationship was assumed to be linear. And right now it's extended to be nonlinear cases where you can model the cables, belts like shown here, clothes, like the one, the jacket here, biomechanical systems, and many, many others. So that's a development of multibody system dynamics. Now, uh, let me see. So it's a uh, 25 minutes. I tried to make it 20 minutes, hopefully even less than that. Now, the first way that you can model the flexible bodies is called this lump mass approach, which is um, not very complicated approach. It is based on the concept that you take your original body and you divided that original body to several rigid bodies. So one body goes to several rigid bodies. Okay. What are you going to do then? So let's say that you have the original beam-like body like this, and then you divided that to several pieces of bodies, it can be pieces of beams like shown here. Now what you're going to do then is that you're going to introduce the spring elements for all the six degrees of freedom between these beam-like bodies or piece of beam-like bodies, if you may. And then these uh, spring elements are described by external applied forces here in the equation of motion and that the bodies are counted by, by a number of generalized coordinates and the inertia properties, of course. And that gives like a system where there is a masses connected together via springs. And this is the one way to describe the deformation. And it can, even certain aspect and certain extent, take this nonlinear behavior into account. This is, however, not used much at the moment. And the, the reason behind it is that this is computationally very heavy procedure because these springs, they might have a very high um, elastic coefficient or spring coefficient. And because of the high spring coefficient, they can lead to situation that there is a very high frequency vibration, which is a big problem in terms of efficient numerical time integration scheme. And uh, there is actually almost no way to avoid that situation and that's why this is used in a certain simple structures and used in a certain cable structures but in uh, computationally challenging applications not often used and remember the time that we look at that video there were a couple movies and a couple animations made and at that time this was this lump mass approach was the only approach available to model deformable bodies and you see that there is a simple manipulator that was modeled as a flexible structure. You can see a little bit of vibration when this end is reaching the final end. And this white structure here was modeled as a flexible body using this um, lump mass approach. Here is a crane that is also based on this uh, lump mass approach. It's fairly rigid when there is no uh, payload in the free end of the crane, and you really don't see much of the animation, the white brace. Okay, here is in short, nice method, but computation a little bit expensive because of this um, spring coefficient can introduce high natural frequencies, and it can lead to situation where the system becomes to be numerically stiff. Numerically stiff means that you have a system where there is a simultaneously high frequencies and low frequencies. And this combination of high and low frequencies are very complicated for time integration schemes. And you want to avoid that scenario as much as you can. And it, this uh, procedure can be applied mainly for beam-like structures. Sure, it could be in theory applied to other kind of structures, but then there this uh, spring connection becomes to be very complicated. Material modeling, I mean, damping models are simple, easy to implement, easy to use, simple theory, because the theory is the same that in a flex, it's going to be rigid multibody dynamics. Okay, then 
another method that is used heavily in industry at the moment. And I think that I'm going to have a couple, maybe one example next week regarding this uh, floating frame reference formula. And then I have some examples today too. In this example, we are manipulating the kinematics used in multi-body system dynamics. Remember, we use this kinematics over and over again, where we have this vector U bar. So it was all the time such that we are computing the translation of the body reference coordinate system. And then we're taking the rotation of the body coordinate system into account like this. And then we have the U vector U bar that is telling where the particle is located with respect to body reference coordinate system. What we're going to do next is that we're going to say that, yeah, this is uh, where the body is originally, but the body deformation can be described by vector U bar F. And this U bar F, this is the one that we're estimating using the method called finite element method. Finite element method. Many of you have maybe have heard about it, the finite element method, and this is it. This is basically a combination of two procedures, multi-body system dynamics and finite element method. And in a floating frame reference formula, so we make them work together. We make them merge. And that means that the reference motion, rigid body motion, if you wanted to say that, is described by using these uh, multi-body system dynamics, and the superimposed deformation is described by using finite element method. Fairly simple. How it goes then? Well, it goes such that this vector U bar F, this one here, is going to be then computed by using finite element procedure. And in a finite element procedure, this is how you can compute the uh, dynamics of uh, a finite element model, structural model. And you're simply solving this this one here. Sorry that the F is missing here in a sub-index here. So it should be U bar F. You compute it there. You substitute that to kinematics. You apply that in a multi-body system dynamics, and you're done. Simply stated. Of course, this comes with a certain complications and details that are a little bit nasty. But still, this is very straightforward and can be applied to any kind of structures you want. So you're no longer limited to beam-like structures, but you can use uh, solid structures, uh, plate cells, whatever you want. Everything goes. There's a minor trick, a minor thing that is practically always needed when you're using finite term model. And that is something that is called modal reduction. So those of you that are participating, you see SOPAN in scores about, mm, about dynamics. I don't remember exactly what is his... Uh, what is the title of his course? Uh, dynamics, uh, Massing Dynamics. Massing Dynamics, I think that's that's one. In Massing Dynamics, you see explaining million stories about the modern reduction. So uh, here too, if you want to efficiently use finite element method and multi-body system dynamics, it makes sense to use a modern reduction to your multi-body, excuse me, your finite element model. Not telling you the details, but this is just for your information this time. you learn more details when you're participating there. The outstanding course, you know, really great course of this university, and that course is called Simulation Laboratory Course. It's great. It's great. Okay, but I will get back to that next week. So here are the few examples about the flexible bodies. This is a flexible shaft that is rotating, and due to the uneven distributed flexibility, you know, this supporting force is our fluctuating quite heavily. Here's a hydraulic driven crane, which is modeled as a flexible body. You know, the swing arm here, submit the lift arm and the swing arm that are not clearly visible, but kind of showing here are the ones that are modeled as a flexible bodies. Here's the example that I showed to you in the very beginning of the class. So this is a biomechanical system where we're estimating the, the strains and stresses of the femur and tibia. And to that end, we're using the finite term models. And we're using the model reduction. And in the model reduction, we're basically looking at what are the dynamic features of the structure, natural frequencies and corresponding deformation modes. 
So this is how they look like. So this is a tailor-made farm model for one specific uh, person. We scanned uh, a person's uh, lower leg by using CT and MRI. And based on that information, we'll build this kind of final thermal model. And that was then used as a part of the multibody model to estimate how much different exercises are introducing the strains and strain rates. Because we wanted to learn what's the bone strengthening process. How is that you can make your bones to be stronger? And it's known that certain exercises make your bones stronger. But what kind of exercise is optimal in, in terms of your bone strength? That's what we wanted to study. And easiest way to do that is, of course, using the simulation. Alternative would be to use practical measurements. But I don't think you want to do that in real life because in practical measurements are going to be very, very painful. I, I don't think you can do that in um, anywhere near to Finland. Okay. Large deformation. Just shortly about this uh, absolute not a corner formulation. I'm not going to expect you to understand the details, but just want to highlight how it works. Disconnected. Okay. Hmm. Okay, it seems that I'm back, but I, I got the I got the information from my OBS that I was offline. But now it seems that I'm back. Okay, so I was about to say that this formulation particularly is tailored particularly for this kind of problems where we deal with the large deformation cases. So instead of day taking a look at the details, so let me show you uh, where this could be used. You know, here are a few uh, theoretical examples first. This is a flying spaghetti, which of course plays no, um, having no business value whatsoever. But it's one of the like benchmark cases where the accuracy and efficiency, computational efficiency of new formulation are tested. And because this is a fairly new formulation, we wanted to test how well it can describe the beam that is having the roughly the same material properties than uh, spaghetti, cooked spaghetti, to be more specific. And what we're going to do for this cook spaghetti is that we're introducing a pin force and the moment to one end of the, the spaghetti as shown here. And then we're simply going to follow how it is flying in here. And it's flying like this. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I think this is a plucking of you a little bit. So let me move this off. Ah, so it's unwilling to move. Like here. So this is a flying spaghetti. Okay, why? Because we wanted to test it, can it predict this correctly? And you know that this is computationally very challenging to compute. And we can, we are created, okay, this is uh, what happens in the reference case too. So we can now apply this in uh, practical examples. And here are the practical examples. You know, maybe, maybe by the way, you know, take a look at the, you know, here in the lower part of my slides, there are papers that are in this subject matter. So I need to, to your final settings to make sure that you can clearly see them. And some of the names you may have, uh, or maybe you're familiar with the certain names, like here is a Kimmo Kerkainen and others that are behind of these studies. So it's a, giving you a little bit of an idea, like who are the, the, the researchers that have been active in the case of large deformation cases. So here is a belt structure that is modeled by using this absolute not a corner formulation. This is a Xerox machine that is modeled by using the absolute not a corner formulation. Belt structure that is modeled by using the same formulation, of course. And then uh, an elevator structure, which, uh, you know, I was looking this this animation, but I was unable to find it. And then, uh, well, this was about the cable dynamics. But unfortunately, I don't have no animations to play that. It being used in a catenary system to model this con train connection to these uh, power cables. It's been used in the modeling of tires. It's been used in the modeling of leaf springs. Leaf springs, yes. Even though that, you know, may not be the most advanced technology, but it's still used in certain vehicle applications. And it's very complicated to model. Okay. 
then in a biomechanical application, the modeling of uh, um, tendons and such, and it being modeled by using this kind of connections and contacts. So this this model here is uh, where we have two beam elements based on the absolute non corner formulation and that twisted together. This is pretty much what happens in Achilles tendon. Uh, this kind of uh, dynamic nano electrical systems, fluid conveyor systems, and optimization of uh, manipulators. And now, at the moment, there is a great trend that is being used in something that is called um, uh, isotermetric analysis. Uh, that means that we simply simplify this um, meshing procedure that is a part of the fine arts element method. I know that I'm really fast here, and there is not much you can memorize from that large deformation case. That's okay. That's completely okay because if you have just a little bit of idea that, okay, even the very large deformation can be modeled today, that's all. That's all that I'm expecting you to remember. If you can remember that this floating frame of reference formulation is something that is heavily used in uh, industrial application, even better. And if you can remember that this uh, lamp mass approach is something that works with a uh, beam-like structures, that's great too. And now, with that, I would like to change my presentation to be something completely different. Uh, hold on, hold on. So, uh, I want to show you, I want to get started with the real-time simulation procedure. Uh, how much time do I have? I have 10 minutes. Okay, it's not much. <clears throat> this is not displaying yet. Hmm, why not? Okay, I guess that I need to... This one. All right. So here's my last set of slides. And uh, this set of slides is about real-time simulation and games. And actually, this title is a little bit of misleading because this is more like what's going on in the industry in terms of um, advanced simulation. And advanced simulation, of course, uh, the real-time simulation is, uh, is an important factor. Uh, gamification, gamification, this kind of stuff is also kind of important. But I'm going to explain other things too. So other things that are you know, related to control schemes and uh, how is that you can make a even predictive simulation, something that you kind of see what happens in the future, kind of have an ability to see what happens in the future. Those are the things that I would like to explain to you. And uh, like I say, I'm not able to close the case today, but that's all right, because we will continue with this explanation next week, Tuesday at 4.15. So real-time simulation and games. So I'm hopefully able to get started with the background and uh, hopefully able to show one or two product processes examples and then uh, finally conclusions. But let's get started here. Here's a few observations that I feel that is important to share with you. And uh, The first one is um, something that is a uh, uh, high motivation to uh, hold on, well, I think that I, what I did is that I jumped one slide. Okay, anyways, I will go back to one slide momentarily. So one thing that is kind of showing the trend, what is happening in the current industry at the moment. And the trend is such that business models, the business opportunities, and business in general, is moving away from material flow processing, meaning that making a physical products, and it started to emphasize increasingly the, the business that is based on the data and knowledge process. Data and knowledge, that's um, software business in short. And you can see that when you look at the, um, how much uh, engineering power is needed to make uh, like heavy machinery products. And of course, we need uh, quite a bit of people from the field of mechanical engineering. But we also need a huge amount of people that are capable to do the software business. And it seems that the software business is the one that is increasing. And uh, this is something that many of the new business opportunities seems to be based on. Now, this is a, 
I mean, you may have thought that, okay, this is a huge risk for us, people from the mechanical engineering. And I feel that is a quite opposite. It's actually not the case at all. There are a lot of things we can help. And the software engineering people are capable to do the software once they know what to do. But how, the, how is that they know what to do? Well, we are the ones that are telling them what makes sense and what is possible. What are the things they can actually do in the software business? So in that perspective, the role of mechanical engineering is emphasized rather than getting smaller. And that's something that I feel that is important up the ways. Now, how is that we tackling that in uh, LUT University? In LUT University, we tackling that by um, having an organization which is a matrix organization, kind of like what you can see in industry. And in this matrix organization, so we have three schools, which is a Lutz School of Business and Management, Lutz School of Energy System, and uh, Lutz School of Engineering Science. But something that is not maybe not so well known is that there are also research platforms that are made such that each one of the schools are participating in these platforms. And one platform that I, that, uh, that I of course, like the, the most is the one that I'm leading, and it's called Morrison Platform. And it's the one that is focusing on this digitalization revolution and how is that we can offer new business uh, opportunities to, to industrial partners based on simulation, based on digitalization. So that's where the multi-body system dynamics meets the business. At least that's my understanding. So, so that's a little bit about the background and more is about to come soon. So what more we can discuss about the background? Let me play you a movie that was made by um, Mevia Company. And Mevia Company is a, is a company that is located close to university, specialized to real-time simulation. Hopefully this plays you well. Manufacturing machines can be a complex and costly process. Assembling the first prototype from parts that haven't been developed or tested together will often cause problems, and getting everything to function properly may require significant amounts of materials and effort. Nobody wants to be known as the manufacturer of poor and unreliable machinery. So wouldn't it be great if you could build your first prototype, secure in the knowledge that it already has hours of thorough testing behind it? Well then, may we introduce you to Mavea. Mavea combines all plans for your machine into a single virtual model called Digital Twin. This includes all the components necessary to build your machine, such as the interface to the real control system. The Digital Twin that is created is a virtual physics-based representation of your machine, capable of simulating its behavior and use in real time. The Mavea software simulates real-life physics, so the machine can be tested in different environments and on the actual tasks that it's designed for. You will be able to detect potential problems before anything is even built. The digital twin can be inspected and modified when necessary, and stakeholders can also get involved in the development process at an earlier stage. The rapid development iterations that the digital twin enables will result in fewer prototypes, reduced costs, and faster lead times. Moreover, Mavea's solutions allow operators to use the simulation for training, which means they will be qualified to use the machine before it even exists. The digital twin lives and evolves throughout the life cycle of the product. Once connected, the digital twin can analyze the machine's use and behavior in the field and provide vital feedback. This data can also be used to develop the product further. With Mavea's digital twin software, you can develop even the most intelligent and complex machines with ease and change the way you engineer and operate your products. Read more about Mavea Digital Twin on our website. Okay, so that's in a nutshell. There are a few keywords that I would like to explain a bit further. Even though that this video was uh, kind of focusing on uh, product development, but it really wanted to also to highlight that the re simulation, real-time simulation, but real-time simulation in specifically, can be used in a wide variety of product processes, starting from the concept design, well, detail design, validation, production, 
marketing, sales, operation, and service. It can be used each of these phases. Uh, what are you going to hear, what are you going to learn next week, Tuesday at 4.15 is how is we using the simulation in all of these product processes. So with that, I'm going to close today and I hope to see you face to face in the largest lecture room of the university. So that's Skinnerilla lecture room, the one that is uh, near to cafeteria. And yeah, that's about it. So now I'm going to close today's streaming. And again, I'm sorry that I was uh, distracted in uh, during the course of this lecture. But uh, I'm going to close this one and I will continue with my discussion in a Teams session. So please use a Teams link to see me in Teams. And then remember to see me face to face on Tuesday. Okay. Here, now it was missed. Okay. See you soon.